All right, y'all turn to Luke chapter 1. We're going to resume our study of the uh, book of Luke and deal with the next, uh, next thing we're faced with here. Um, while we're turning there and getting started, let me give you all an update on Chris. Um, I saw him yesterday and so did Wayne. They went in and they've done a, you know, a second surgery to remove some infection in the leg and um, this time they've got a vacuum pump on it and it's, it's like draining it for him. So um, hopefully that's going to get him healing. You know, a few days he can get healing, they'll get him back in therapy because he's ready to get over there in therapy and it sounds like they all want him there because they're all coming by. And um, it turns out not everybody is a, is a candidate when you get your, you know, amputation. Not everybody's a candidate for therapy and I guess they judge a lot of things about the person but based on some comments Chris made and also the doctors coming and looking, it seems like one of the things they they base it on is just their willingness and their and, and Chris is like come on show me what I need to do so and every time I leave he says tell y'all he misses you and he loves you and thank you for your prayers and don't be surprised when he comes through that back door so we're sure looking forward to that but y'all please keep praying for him um, I, I have never personally um, seen the Lord uh, give someone such peace and positive attitude over so long a period of time. In other words, it, there's no doubt it's the answer of prayer, exactly like Philippians says, and Chris said he knows it, he feels it. You know, we all know our natural demeanor, and my natural demeanor, if you put me in there with everybody waking me up and prod me, I wouldn't be in a good mood, you know, but um, so I thank the Lord for that, and also I ask y'all, please, remember to pray for uh, Brother Dan Schroeder and his wife. Um, they, they need it, and both of them. Um, I'm trying to remember if I'm forgetting anybody. Trisha's family, um, look, when I do forget, normally when someone asks me to pray for them, unless they ask specifically ask, you know, to ask the group, I don't. But normally if you ask me, it's not that I forgot. Generally speaking, I'll pray for you right then because if I don't, I'll forget. And then anytime you come on my mind. But if I'm sitting at my desk, I write the name down and I can remember. So anyway, let's go to Lord in prayer before we get started. Our Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you for dealing with us in, in compassion and mercy and not in wrath as we deserve. Lord, please open our hearts and minds today. Stoop down to us in our, our, just, our lukewarmness, Lord, and our just pure stupidity at times. Help us to understand your scriptures. Help us to see the truth that you would have us to see. Help us to see it not for our own edification personally, Lord, but that we might be built up in Christ as members of the body, that we might glorify him, that we might testify, and that we might go out and do the work that you've given us to do. We ask these things in Christ Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to pick up today in verse 39, Luke 1, 39. Let's read the passage first. Now, I've debated whether to split this into two or not, and so I decided I've got my notes together to cover all of it, and I hope we can. But what we really have here is we've got two things. The first thing in verse 39. Now, if you all recall where we're at, Mary had been told by Gabriel that she was going to have Christ. And he also told her, and by the way, your kinsman, and Elizabeth has called her cousin, Cousin, and odds are it's, it, it doesn't necessarily mean cousin. It's kinswoman. Hebrew, you got to watch the words father in Hebrew. There's no grandfather. So everybody, you know, Abraham's their father. And also cousin is, is kind of our loose interpretation. You know how when we know we're kin to someone, you say, well, that's our some second, third, fourth cousin or something. We don't know exactly how she was kin, but it obviously shows us that uh, there was marriage on the Levite side in her family. But anyway, Mary, it says in verse 39, arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste. Now notice she did it with haste. Before we read this, I want to say this. You know, most of you ladies like to talk. Um, some guys like to talk. Not, not, I'm, not a, I'm not a talker. I get uncomfortable when I'm put on the spot, and that's my own problem. But um, if ever two women had something to talk about, it's these two ladies, isn't it? I mean, you talk about two women that were ready to talk. I can picture the excitement, and, and Elizabeth doesn't even know she's coming. So he says, Mary arose in those days, went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah, and entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth. And it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost. And she spake out with a loud voice and said, Blessed art thou among women, and blessed is the fruit of thy womb. Now that hits us former Catholics hard, doesn't it? We know those words. That's, again, part of the, the so-called Hail Mary. 
he did, she then says, Whence is this to me that the mother of my Lord should come to me? For lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in mine ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. And blessed is she that believed, for there shall be a performance of those things which were told her from the Lord. Now that's Elizabeth's portion. Some people believe that this was said in the form of a song, and, and I don't know if it was or not. Certainly the next four are called songs. They even have names from the early church. But let's read on the second part, 46. Mary said, My soul doth magnify the Lord. Now that word magnify, if you look in your Bible, some of y'all might have titles and it might say the Magnificate. Anybody have that title in their Bible? That's just the Latin word for to magnify. And this prayer, this song is called the Magnificate. You'll see a lot of people preach sermons, the Magnificate, around Christmas and whatnot. So she says, verse 47, My spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. Thank God for that word. What does that tell us about Mary? She needed a Savior, and she knew it, didn't she? And Jesus Christ is her Savior. She, she says, For he hath regarded the lowest state of his handmaiden. For behold, from henceforth all generations shall call me blessed. And that's happened, hadn't it? She, I'm sure she never expected anyone would worship her, and that's sad, but she did know she would be called blessed. For he that is mighty hath done to me great things, and holy is his name. Notice he hath done. What's that tell us? She's already conceived. Now it says, His mercy is on them that fear Him from generation to generation. He hath showed strength with His arm. He hath scattered the proud in the imagination of their hearts. He hath put down the mighty from their seats and exalted them of low degree. He hath filled the hungry with good things, and the rich hath He sent away empty. Or sent empty away. He hath opened his servant Israel in remembrance of his mercy, as he spake to our fathers, to Abraham and to his seed forever. And Mary abode with her about three months and returned to her own house. Now, we're going to go back and look at this in its, in its pieces and talk about some things, but I'd like to add this before we go. If she went back after three months, I don't know if she stayed for the birth or not. It seems like, why would she leave? You know, of course she would stay. But then the next thing we read is it said Elizabeth's full time came. But either way you go. If Elizabeth was in her sixth month and Mary stays there three months, we know one thing. Just as soon as Gabriel told her, what did Mary do? She took off. Now it's about 80 miles roughly from Nazareth down to the hill country of Judah. So it's, you know, four days journey. I mean, can you all imagine this young teenage girl making that journey? It didn't say anybody went with her, does it? You talk about, that's dangerous, isn't it? How, how bad was she wanting to get there? She's wanting to see, and you got to ask yourself why, you know? Why did Mary go? Well, she obviously uh, was told that Elizabeth was pregnant. Now, what's the first thing she knows about Elizabeth? She's an old lady with no children. She's barren. So it's, it's given to her as a sign that, hey, God does have power in the womb, doesn't he? But I picture myself as Mary's traveling. I, I'm sure Mary's not like me, but I'm, I'm cynical by nature. I don't like that about myself, but I am. And, and I tend to... I tend to not believe good things that, that might happen to me or whatnot. In other words, I, I start talking myself. He, I tell Lexi, if me and Lexi have a disagreement, if you'll just wait a while, I'll figure out what I did wrong because I always find my wrong in things. And I picture Mary traveling. If she's anything like me, over the course of that three or four days, I'm pretty sure I could talk myself out of believing. I would be able to say, well... Is that really what he said? Or did he say it to me? In other words, I would be able on that trip to start having some doubts. Well, what does God's letter go down there for? For reassurance. She believed, and I picture her faith as little. When she gets down there with Elizabeth, what happens? She gets confirmation because before she says anything, what does Elizabeth say to her? You're pregnant with the Son of God. You see, this was for Mary. It was for Elizabeth. Now, I love, real quick, look at verse 45. Elizabeth says, Blessed is she that believed. Now, she means when Mary heard the promise, Mary believed, didn't she? But where is this set at? It's in Zacharias' house, who's still alive. I don't know how she said it. It's possible Elizabeth could have said to Mary, Well, blessed is she that believed, looking at Zacharias, because did Zacharias believe? No. And what did Zacharias get? A blessing? 
He got chastisement, didn't he? You know, believers are blessed. Unbelievers get a curse when they reject the truth, and an unbelieving believer gets chastisement. In other words, Zacharias is not lost, but he didn't believe, and what did God do? He put him under chastisement, didn't he? So I don't know if it was a shot at him or not. It, again, he couldn't hear. She might have intimated, you know, you know how it could have been. Who knows? All right, but let's go back and talk about it now. Now, what we've got here is we really got a meeting of, of two kind of covenants. I'll put it that way. And what I mean by that is we've got a picture here. If you all think about, if we just draw out a timeline here, and I put back here, and I say back here we've got the representation of the Old Covenant. Okay? Did anyone ever gain life by the keeping of the Old Covenant? Only thing a person could gain by the Old Covenant was the death of the flesh. In other words, they would be convicted of their sin. Now, once they were convicted and humbled, then the ceremonies could preach the gospel unto them, couldn't it? But the Old Covenant never saved anyone. And so we'll put the cross in between, and we'll come over here and we'll put the New Covenant. You know, one of the primary verses in all of Scripture, it seems like it means very little, but it's back there in Genesis. And in the book of Genesis, really you have all the doctrines of the Bible back there in little hints and pictures and types. But it says of Sarah, Sarah was barren. She couldn't bear fruit. And you all know that is a picture of mankind. It's a picture of the church. It's a picture of human, the, the whole race, isn't it? And so what we find out about Sarah is Sarah could not bear fruit unless God did it in her. Now, what does that sound like to you all? That sounds like Christ in the gospel, doesn't it? So what we really have here is we've got a situation where we've got one woman is barren, and by the way, she's old, she's barren, she's married, and by the way, she's married to a priest. Now look, I don't want to uh, read more into the passage that is there, but were priests well respected in Israel? Oh yeah. Yeah. So folks, I mean, you're not talking about somebody that was having trouble making ends meet, right? She was well respected. There she was in a place of prominence, married to a priest. She's very near to Jerusalem, isn't she? The hill country, they say, is within three to five miles. I don't know how accurate that is. Jerusalem. And yet, this woman has no fruit. Now make the comparison. You know, the Bible is wonderful in that it teaches so often by comparison. Y'all ever notice that? How often we'll have two people laid side by side in Scripture for us to look at. Now that's no coincidence. Uh, people that understand these things say the human mind learns best by comparison. Remember when we used to watch uh, Sesame Street or Electric Company? Which one of these things doesn't belong? And remember all of that? We do. We learn by comparison. If we compare these two, over here what do we have? A virgin. And folks, she is young, very young. Okay? Now, whereas this one is married to a priest, this one again is a virgin, and she's not from the family of any high lifted up priest. She is as lowly as you can get. And where is she from? Nazareth. And what was viewed as the lowest? Y'all know over here we talk about Theodore. Theodore, it's just, I mean, when you say Theodore, you think, it's just not, we don't think good things. We don't think the, the I'm trying to think of a, all right, when I say someone is an 08 or in Mobile, okay, James knows what, Maddie knows, Maddie, you are an 08 or aren't you? Okay, all right. An 08 or means that you live in the vicinity of the country club over there in Spring Hill. And look, it's a term that they themselves use. You can see it in Mobile Bay Monthly Magazine. They'll refer to 08 ers. People aspire to be an 08 or. It just basically means you've arrived, social status, right? Now, it doesn't mean everybody in 08 is rich or anything like that. It just means in general it refers to people of higher status, right? Well, what about when I say St. Elmo? Mm. ain't talking about much, are we? <laughs> you see, it, it's just, and I'm not saying everybody in St. Elmo's, I'm just showing you all that in the idea of social status. So one of them is high and lifted up, and yet what is she? Barren. And the other one is a virgin, and yet what is she? 
She's pregnant with the Son of God. Now granted, this one has become pregnant, but all her life, what has she represented? Death. Death. Folks, what we're doing here is we're seeing the transition of two covenants. And whereas the, the old covenant is coming to a close, look, I'll just put it like this. I'll put Elizabeth here. And look, Elizabeth spends most of her life fruitless, and then all of a sudden, John comes, doesn't he? And what is John? Well, he's the last Old Testament prophet, but he's the first New Testament prophet, isn't he? And what is John's message? Christ is coming. Christ is coming. But before that, he had one other word. Repent. Repent. Now, what was this designed to do? Show people their sin. And so, in an allegory, what we have here is we've got the two covenants. Look, here's John. I'll switch colors, so put Christ on the cross. Here's Christ, and I'll put him high here, Christ. And now what we've basically got is we've got Mary coming from Elizabeth. Elizabeth to John, Mary to Christ. I don't mean to put Mary exalted. I just want to show you all she's bringing in Christ. We've got a change taking place, don't we? And whereas once it was barrenness, now there's going to be new life. And yet who has got to bring the life? Christ. Christ. Folks, Mary never did anything. The Holy Spirit appeared to her and said, you're going to conceive, didn't he? Now, Elizabeth, no doubt, had been trying to conceive her whole life. Mary had never tried. Y'all see the, the two covenants there? It's okay. interesting that John was cut off. Huh? It's interesting that John was cut off before Christ. He, he was, that's right. And everything that happens, look, John was a forerunner. In fact, if I was to ask y'all, uh, think of a way to say it. All right, who was the smallest prophet that, that ever existed? John? Huh? Was it John? It'd be John. When did John prophesy the very first time? How tall y'all think John was when he prophesied the first time? He's about that big. He prophesied in the womb, didn't he? In the womb, he was already filled with the Spirit, and he leaped with joy. Why? Because Christ had come in the room. Christ in Mary. And, and this is a beautiful picture. It's showing us that, folks, John was announcing already what? Christ. And from the womb. Good, good thing he wasn't born enough. It is. And I tell y'all, look, I don't want to turn this into a class on abortion, but y'all know that's about our worst national sin. Um, it's not that, I mean, and let me say this. If you or any of us have, have had an abortion or as a man, if we have talked a girl into abortion or supported it, we can't, look, we don't need justification. We need to acknowledge to God this is a sin and we need forgiveness for it, don't we? Is abortion part of the uh, sins that Christ died and paid for? Yes, it is. But we don't, we don't never put ourselves in a position to justify it. Now, why do I say it's a horrible national sin? It's Folks, it's murdering unborn children for what? Convenience. Convenience. Really, for convenience and lifestyle. And every time we see Israel fall to their lowest position in the Old Testament, when do they hit rock bottom? When they kill their children. And I mean, if you think our country's in a good state, it's not. We're in a horrible state, and what's happening to us is the result of these things. But in the, in the womb, John begins prophesying, okay? So, these are the two covenants. Now, John's message of repent. I want to I talk about this for a minute. Go to Leviticus 26. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Leviticus 26. In the middle of all these Levite laws, I shouldn't say in the middle, towards the end, <clears throat> God has given them all this law, and he, he says the following thing in chapter 26. Now, the Old Covenant, don't ever get the idea that the Old Covenant was... Um, had gave God room to change his mind. God never changes his mind. I got to sneeze, y'all. <laughs> <Yes. laughs> <sighs> <Ugh. sighs> 
He deals with people differently based on what he's already said. Now what I mean by that is, when he gave them the old covenant, there are those that say he had made this offer to Israel, Israel wouldn't do what he said, so God sat back and said, well, let's see. Tell you what, he took it from them and said, I'll give it to the Gentiles. That never happened. What happened was God gave them a covenant and he said to them now, if, right? You know, we all do this. I hear, Sienna just asked me if she could go stay at Gina's, right? And I gave her an answer. Well, we'll see. We'll see if you behave this week. You know, it's a good, it's a good form of leverage, isn't it? And so really it's up to Lexi, but I like acting like I'm, you know, got something going here. But the point being is, I could say to her, if you behave, you can go. If you don't behave, you won't go. Now, if she doesn't get to go, did I change my mind? God never changed his mind. This is what he said in verse 3. If you walk in my statutes and keep my commandments and do them. Now, he never meant flawlessly, sinlessly. What he meant was if you've got an honest and a sincere desire in your heart to walk with me and to keep these things and, and you're sorry when you sin and you go through the right channel. In other words, if you are obedient, this is what I'll do. It's conditional. It's conditional, yes. He says, then I will give you rain in due season. Y'all know it started raining this morning. And Sienna said, uh-oh, it's raining. And I like to joke with her. And I said, well, did you order rain? You know, but y'all know we're all so quick to complain when it rains and it's an inconvenient for us. What do we need to see it as? Blessing. Folks, it's a blessing from God. That's life from above. Yeah. So he says, the land shall yield or increase. The trees of the field shall yield their fruit. You know, when I was little, this was still happening. In our country, we were still, look, there was a time when we fed the world, didn't we? It ain't that anymore. And it's, you say, well, God didn't take the rain. No, God gave us up to our ungodly desires and covetousness and corporate greed has robbed our country of everything. I'll give you another example. When I was little, anytime we went fishing, we had a five-gallon bucket and we put the cast net in it. Did y'all do that, Lonnie? And that's because my old man and later my uncle showed me, if we don't catch any fish, we can always get a mess of mullet. And mullet was the best anyway, wasn't it? <laughs> See, the reason is the fish were so thick out there. They ain't anymore. Mm -hmm. And you say, well, did God kill them all? No. God took the restraining hand away and let man do as man desires. And what does man do? Right. Runs it right into the ground, okay? So he says, your threshing shall reach unto the vintage. And look, these are all just uh, promises. I'll give you peace and all these blessings are going to have. But watch verse 14. But if you will not hearken unto me and will not do all these commandments, if you shall despise my statutes. Now, do y'all think our country despises the things of God? Yes. Absolutely. Y'all know that God in our country is seen as an inhibition to a good time. Didn't he? He, me and Lexi can walk in a room and people will be laughing and cutting up. And when me and Lexi walk in, everything changes. It'd be, you'll hear laughing at good jokes and we walk in, everybody's kind of, well, I, look, I like a good joke too. But the point being is they think, well, there goes the good time. Those Christians are here, right? And what it really amounts to is, I mean, I remember growing up hating Sundays. I hated Sundays. I loved Saturdays, but I hated Sundays because I had to go down there to that building and sit there, and I was miserable. Would you like that, Lonnie? Yeah. I mean, miserable. I go to and read comic books. Yeah, sure. <laughs> but the whole point is that God was just Im infringing on our good time. And that's what we think about, you know, laws. And it's like Meathead told Archie, you and your puritanical views, you know, it, free love and a good time and all that. And that's how people view these things. But what he's really saying here is he says, look, if you will not serve me. He said, if you shall despise my statutes or your soul shall abhor my judgments so that you will not do all my commandments, but that you break my covenant. Now, what is it to abhor God's judgments? Hate, Hate God's decrees. Has God decreed such a thing as thou shalt not kill? And what do the lawmakers in our country mostly say? Mm -hmm. Well, now hold on. That's not exactly true. I mean, everything we're told is that the Bible says is sin. Our 
society says, no, it's not sin. You people are hateful. And where they're really heading, and look, I hate to see it happening, but y'all take my word, it won't be long that the Bible is going to be labeled as hate speech. That's where we're headed. And once that happens, it, you, everything's going to corrupt really quick. But the point being is, Israel didn't like the worship of God. And so Israel turned from God. So what did God say he would do? I'll turn from you. But watch how he turns at first. He said, I'll do this unto you. I'll even appoint over you terror, consumption, the burning ague. In other words, I'll take you good health away from you. Disease will flourish. Well, we got that going, don't we? He said, I'll set my face against you, and you shall be slain before your enemies. They that hate you shall reign over you, and you'll flee when none pursueth. Verse 18 says, If you will not yet for all this hearken unto me. Do you all see how that's chastisement? Did they have a chance to hearken unto him? But they didn't, did they? Now, they would turn. The book of Judges is a good example. God would say, do this, and, and Israel wouldn't do it. And they would go so far as to worship idols and eventually offer their children to Moloch. And God would let them go into bondage, wouldn't he? When it got so bad that they began to cry out for the Lord, every time God was faithful, he raised up a deliverer and delivered them. But how sincere was their repentance? Not very sincere for the most of them. Not all, but for most of them. So they turned back. And each time what happened? It got worse and worse. So he says, If you'll not hearken unto me for all this, then will I punish you seven times more for your sins. Now folks, seven times more is not a, a mathematical figure to figure out the years and all. It, seven is the number of perfection. In other words, I'll, I'll put this on you and if that don't work, well, I'll go to stage two. I'll move to my next step. Don't we all say this with kids? Mm -hmm. Y'all know kids. I, I've told y'all so many times my granny's favorite words to me is, well, we can do this the easy way or we can do it the hard way. And I would have to consider each time. Now, well, let's see. And I hated being ruled over, but I knew one thing. Being ruled over by her was better than being tore up by her. And so we make a decision, don't we? But, you know, if I didn't adhere to the verbal uh, warning, what happened next? It got worse. And it's the same in these things. Watch, he says. I'll break the pride of your power. I'll make your heaven as iron and your uh, earth as brass. In other words, I'll turn off the rain. Do y'all know that the Jerusalem was once one of the most gorgeous, beautiful, that whole area? That whole area from the Fertile Crescent all the way over was once one of the, what is it today? Barren. Folks, it's barren. Now he says, um, verse 21, If you walk contrary unto me and not hearken unto me, I'll bring seven times more plagues upon you. I'll send wild beasts among you. And each time it's getting worse and worse, isn't it? And it keeps going. 23, If you'll not be reformed by me by these, but walk contrary to me, I'll walk contrary to you. Verse 25 says, I'll bring a sword upon you. He'll bring in a foreign enemy, won't he? Did he do it? Yeah. You know, he said Nebuchadnezzar was his servant. You know what Nebuchadnezzar did when he destroyed the temple and killed so many Jewish people? He did exactly what God brought him there to do. He was God's servant to do that. And he says, when I broke the staff of your bread, you know, war and famine and all these things, he says in 27, if you'll not for all this hearken unto me, but walk contrary to me, I'll walk contrary unto you also in fury and I... Even I will chastise you seven times for your sins. You shall eat the flesh of your sons and the flesh of your daughters you shall eat. You see how God's punishment matched the severity of their sin? Where does it end at? Did this happen? Folks, this took place in 70 A.D. There has never been a time like 70 A.D. You read Josephus. If y'all have never read it, just look it up online. You don't even have to buy his books like that. Just go and read the account of 70 A.D. And I tell you what, it'll raise the hair on the back of your neck. It's horrible. Why? Because they turned from God. And he says, You'll destroy, I'll destroy your high places. God did that. He destroyed their, their, their most prized possession, which was their temple. Herod's temple had been turned into a big center for commerce, hadn't it? What has church and system become in our country? It's a big money-making thing. It says, 32, I'll bring the land into desolations. Your enemies which dwell therein shall be astonished at you, and I will scatter you among the heathen. Where are they at today? 
<laughs> scattered among the heathen. Now, in our lifetime, we've seen a large portion of them going back to the land. But, folks, that's more a, that's more a product of the United Nations and Zionism than it is of anything else. Don't get too caught up in that. What he's basically telling them is, I'm giving you this law, and you're either going to desire to serve me or you're not. If you try and serve me sincerely, I'll bless you. If you don't, you'll be cursed. And what are they today? Cursed. cursed. Folks, look at the curse that came on the Jewish people through Adolf Hitler. I'm not saying those people deserved it. I'm saying those people suffered for their, their personal history, didn't they? You realize we're suffering right now for our history? I, think, I look back on how generations change, and I think about how like my granny's generation, and she would talk about her, her dad and her uh, grand, and my great-grandpa and how every evening he sat down and read the Bible and talked to them and all, and yet my granny didn't do that. Now, she read her Bible, but she didn't talk to her kids about it. She never really talked to me about it, and yet then comes the next generation that didn't read their Bible at all. You see what happens? It doesn't take long till what do we have? We've got a generation that don't know God and they're suffering for the sins of their fathers. And it doesn't mean that we don't deserve it. We're all sinners. We get what we got coming, but this is how a nation falls. And so what was all this designed to do? Look at verse uh, oh, 38. You shall perish among the heathen, and the land of your enemies shall eat you up. Folks, that has happened. I mean, right down to the, today, it's still happening. They that are left of you shall pine away in their iniquity in your enemies' lands, and also in the iniquities of their father shall they pine away with them. To pine away means what? To cry away. To just cry, to be moan. And y'all ever seen one of those Orthodox Jews at the Wailing Wall? What are they doing there? Crying. Crying for their temple to be rebuilt, pining away. Now he says, 40, if they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their fathers, I want you all to see the national sense of this. Look, this is exactly what Daniel did. Daniel knew they were in Babylon because of their sins, didn't they? Remember we covered this a couple weeks ago? And oh, right about here, Daniel saw that the 70 weeks were coming to an end. So what did Daniel think? We're it, going back home. We're going back home. It's time for the kingdom and the Messiah. So what did he do? He got down on his knees and said, we brought this on ourselves. He followed exactly what the law told him to do. He never said, you Jews... Are those unbelievers, how did Daniel pray? We. He said, we have sinned against you. We have done this. Watch what he tells them to do. If they shall confess their iniquity, the iniquity of their fathers, with their trespasses, which they trespass against me, and that they have walked, also they walked contrary unto me, that I also have walked contrary unto them, and brought them into the land of their enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts be humbled, and they accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then will I remember my covenant with Jacob, and also my covenant with Isaac, my covenant with Abraham. I'll remember, and I'll remember the land. Now, basically what he's telling them to do is this. The old covenant was put in place to bring Israel to a point of what? Repentance. So Elizabeth gives birth, and what is the message of her son? Repent. Repent. And not only repent, don't just do it with your mouth, he told him. He said, bring forth fruits, meat for repentance. In other words, I don't want lip service. We're going to turn and worship God. Does that make sense? Now, that's kind of what we've got here. We've got a transition from Elizabeth to Mary and from John to Christ. Okay? Have I lost anybody there? All right, let's move on. Now, uh, barren women in Scripture, again, are nothing new. I mean, we got them starting with uh, Sarah and Rebecca and Rachel and Hannah and all down through Scripture, we've got them. It's, it's a constant reminder of this thing. But the parallel accounts of these two visits of Gabriel, y'all flip back over to Luke 1. If you go back, we won't do it now, but if y'all go back later and y'all read side by side the account of Gabriel to, uh, to Zechariah, and the account to Mary, you'll find out they parallel each other. I mean, it's nearly the same language. <clears throat> but what the priest couldn't do, which was produce a child with his wife, the Holy Spirit does do in Mary. And folks, that is the message of the New Covenant.
what man could never do. Look, Zacharias represents the priesthood, the law, works. What man could never do, the Holy Spirit steps in and does in someone without the help of man. And that's regeneration. That's the whole picture. <clears throat> All right, now let's go back to verse 39 and deal with it verse by verse. Mary arose in those days and went into the hill country with haste into a city of Judah. So Mary goes in haste, and we know how long she stayed, three months. Now again, Elizabeth is her kinswoman, and it's about 80 miles. But when I say, why did Mary go? Well, I suspect she went for comfort and for confirmation. You know, there's a, there's a way we say that misery loves company. We say that, and that's true, isn't it? Misery does love company. But there's a flip side of that. Where, what's y'all's favorite place to go? Home. Home, yeah. I'll tell y'all my favorite place in this whole world is right here on Sunday morning. It just don't get any better than this. Right here, and I like Wednesday nights, but Sunday morning I see more of y'all. Right here on Sunday morning, why? Because I'm with people that think like me, that believe like me. I'm with people that look out at the world and understand that there's more than this. I'm with people that want to worship the Lord. Where was Elizabeth or Mary? Who was she going to go tell? What was she going to say? I mean, where is she going to go and say, I'm, pr you see? So where does she go? She goes to somebody that's going, right? And when she gets down there, the amazing thing is there's nothing in the story that ever says she said anything to Joseph yet, has she? She's got no proof she's pregnant. It just happened, right? But when she comes home, y'all think about poor old Joseph. Mary has been gone three months, and she comes home pregnant. Do y'all see what Joseph was up against? I mean, what would any human being think? She she's gone off and cheated on me. And you see why the, the angel had to send Joseph a message, right? So she goes down here for, for comfort. Now God brings her down here for confirmation. See, God used this to strengthen her faith by a sign and by fellowship with other believers. Folks, we build each other up. Paul said we ought to edify each other, not tear each other down. That's why one of the things that I, that, you know, in the list of seven things that God hates, you know which one he puts down there at the bottom last to imprint it on our minds? Pride. Pride's first. Yes. Sowing discord among the brethren. Well, look, there's nothing, I'll tell y'all, all of y'all so you know, if you ever get a phone call from someone in this group and they're wanting to talk about someone else, right, negatively about something, don't do it. Leave it alone. Don't have it. If they persist in it, tell them I'm not having any of this. If they try again, tell me. And I'll deal with it. And this is, it's a horrible thing to sow discord among like-minded believers. If y'all have never come out of church chaos, I, I'm thankful for you. I don't, Lonnie, you know about it, don't you? I know me and Wayne know about it. it Sully, yeah. Bobby, you've seen it. You know, there's nothing worse than to get up and go to a place and your stomach's in knots. Because, I mean, me and Wayne seen them sling Bibles. I mean, sling and throw, and I mean, I've seen just nearly knock down drag outs, haven't we, Wayne? What in the world does that say to a lost person? I don't want to you see, I don't want no part of that. And so it's, it's just, look, that's one of the worst things you can do. So Mary runs to Elizabeth, and it's great, if you, if you look again in verse 40, she entered into the house of Zacharias and saluted Elizabeth, okay? So she salutes her. And before she can say anything, it came to pass that when Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leaped in her womb, and Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Ghost, and she began to speak. Isn't that wonderful for Mary? You talk about confirmation for this poor little girl. I mean, she knew what she had seen and heard, but who else is going to believe her? Well, she's got at least somebody here, doesn't she? And so um, what God does here, it's, it's a kind of amazing, is it's Romans 8, 28. All things work together for good to them who love God. She traveled 80 miles, probably risking her life as a young virgin traveling all that way. And when she gets there, does it work out for her benefit? But y'all know what? It works out for Elizabeth's benefit too. Her fate's built up, isn't it? What about old Zacharias? 
is good for him too. He's further chastised. And I mean, you imagine he looks at this little girl and says, here she is, uh, a teenager that believed the promise that was harder to believe than the one I, a priest all my life, wouldn't believe. Now, nobody's saying he's going to hell or lost. We're just saying Zacharias had little faith. Mary had bigger faith. Right? Both of them needed their faith built, didn't they? Abraham and his wife did the same. Same good analogy, Wayne. Thank you. Abraham and Sarah. Abraham had big faith, and Sarah had, Sarah had weaker faith. Both of them had faith. Don't ever deny or despise uh, weak faith. Weak faith is faith, thank God. Matter of fact, we're told in the Scripture, never despise the day of little things. It will. Hey, you know, it's like when we, we pray for our children or our loved ones, we want them to see them. the least little anything. We look at it and we grab it, don't we? You say, that, that's a step. That's something. We're going in the right direction. And you talk to your loved ones about it, but you don't talk to lost loved ones, do you? You talk to your friends in Christ. You say, hey, guess what? You say, what? Say, you know what? I, I shared the gospel with so-and-so and they didn't hit me. You know, and it, you see, and they're still talking to me. Or, hey, so-and-so, I saw a Bible on their counter. Don't we all feel that sort of thing? Don't despise little. I'm not saying all that salvation. I'm saying you and I are always looking for those little things, aren't we? Well, here Elizabeth speaks to Mary, and it's no little thing she says. She confirms all the words of the angel, doesn't she? Now, how did Elizabeth do this? She was filled with the Holy Ghost. You know, so many times in the Old Testament we read, and so-and-so was filled with the Holy Ghost, and what comes next? And they begin to prophesy. They begin to speak. You know, when the Holy Ghost reveals the truth to us concerning Christ, what do we begin to do? We begin to speak, don't we? It's the same thing. And that's why Paul said, I believe, therefore I speak. Someone says, why can't you shut up about this? Well, because I believe it. I believe it and I know that it's what you need. And without it, I know where you're heading. Now, you may not believe that, but I believe it. And therefore, if I care about you at all, i got to talk about it. I once had a conversation with a loved one and, and uh, a, a husband and a wife, and they were mad at me because I wouldn't quit trying to talk to them about Jesus. And they said, don't you know we've got religion? We've got our religion, you've got yours. And I said, I don't want to talk to you about religion. I want to talk to you about the Lord Jesus Christ. And they said, we don't want to talk about that. And it's like, how can you possibly say you're a Christian and not want to talk about it? Well, folks, what eventually will happen is if that person's not going to be saved, you'll just be pushed out. And it's heartbreaking. I mean, how can you claim that you love someone and yet look at them and say, well, you're heading to hell, but I don't really care. You see, we can't do that, can we? That's why the world hates us, one of the reasons. Your family will hate you. It'll happen, but don't get discouraged. Just remember, you've got new family. Now, Mary, in this case, not only had her distant family, Elizabeth, but who do you think becomes her closest friend? Elizabeth. Elizabeth. Look, my closest friends are in this room, or on video. I mean, seriously, my closest friends are. And sometimes we get blessed. God blesses us by making our immediate family our closest friends, doesn't he? Amen. What a blessing is that? But the point being is like-minded believers build each other up, and that's what these two do. Now, um, uh, tell you what, the babe leaped in her womb. Look why he leaped. She just said he leaped there, but look at verse 44. Elizabeth said, Lo, as soon as the voice of thy salutation sounded in my ears, the babe leaped in my womb for joy. Let's just consider this for a moment. And I don't want to turn this again into a, a class about abortion, folks. But look, the babe. Did he say that, that wad of protoplasm? No. The babe leaped in my womb for joy. What's that tell us? It's, even alive. it's a human being. Folks, this is a human being. It leaped in her. It's not a part of Mary. It's or Elizabeth. It's a human being inside of her. Could that babe experience joy? Then it's got a soul. Could that baby be filled with the Spirit? Y'all yes. see, it was filled with the Spirit. He was before she was. I mean, this is two lives. There's no way to separate it. And the Scripture is so clear about this. You know, Esau and Jacob are in the womb. She conceives, and what does God call them in the womb? Things? No. They children. They're children. And let me say again, look, if you or I have been involved in abortion, 
Well, then, we're, then we need to just basically say this. Go to God if you've never done so and say, Lord, I, I look back on that and I'm absolutely ashamed of it. Nothing I can do now, but I thank you for not casting me in hell where I deserve to go. It, it was wrong, and I thank you for the grace and mercy that gave me a Savior to pay for it. Help me never do anything like that again. That's what we need. Nobody's condemning you and saying, well, you're going to hell over it. I mean, me and Wayne come from a church where I was taught in a Sunday school one day that abortion didn't mean anything. Mm -hmm. And come to find out later, the one that was teaching it had had an abortion. So they were trying to console their own conscience. You know what I mean? Could have just as easily never mentioned that they had an abortion and just said, look, it's wrong. You know, you don't have to, we don't have to know all the details, do we? Now, the, the fact that John was not a part of the woman's womb, he's not. He's not just part of her body. He's in her body. Okay? So John, uh, right here, in the womb, begins his prophetic ministry. And how does he begin it? With a leap for joy. Now, why was he leaping? Because he had seen Christ. Not with his physical eyes. How did that, that baby in her womb know that there was a baby in uh, Mary's womb? And by the way, how many days had Christ been conceived? Just a few days. And did John leap at the joy of knowing he was in there? Yes. You see, folks, this is from conception. And he leaped with joy. How? He was filled with the Spirit. Then who revealed to John as that little child that this was Christ in her? The Holy Spirit. How do any of us come to see Christ? By the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit testifies within us that Jesus is the Christ. And I don't mean that Jesus Christ lived and died. I mean it comes to fact one day that we see that Jesus, the sinless Son of God, came into the world as God's appointed means, Christ, for my sin. He suffered for me and my sins are paid for. And when you see that, that's the revelation of the Spirit. That's why uh, Paul wrote to the Romans, he said, the Spirit testifies with our spirit that we are the children of God. How does the Spirit testify? Outwardly? Now, he gives Mary an outward sign, but me and you've got something better. We've got the Word of God, don't we? And how does he testify within us? Spirit. Through the Spirit, through that still, small voice. We begin to get confirmations and, and certain physical things that we can see, fruit in action and whatnot. But at first, all we've got to hang our hat on, that this is true, is simply the Word of God, isn't it? And that's faith. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. Now, y'all go over to John 3. I just want to read one more thing here and then we'll take a break. In John 3, 29, John is, uh, he says in 28, You yourselves bear me witness that I said I am not the Christ, but I am sent before him. He that hath the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom, which standeth and heareth him, rejoiceth greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. For this my joy therefore is fulfilled. John fulfilled his joy. When did John's joy start? Back there when he leaped in the womb. 